Good morning, Living Hope Church. My name is Charles. I'm a member of your safety team, and I'll be giving you today's announcements. Children's Ministry is holding a bake sale today only. If you haven't checked them out, please visit them after service. The bake sale is today only. All funds help our kids get to camp. Get five cookies for a dollar or one large item for five dollars. We also have a donation wall for children's camp. We just need 50 donations. Choose an envelope numbered one through 50. Place the envelope with your donation in the boxes in the back of the sanctuary. Envelopes will only be available today. Take one if you wish to help. Bring it back later this month. Are you interested in joining our tech and media team? We invite you to attend the worship workshop Saturday, July 1st. This workshop will be held from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and it will be in English and Spanish. Lunch will be provided. We hope to see you there. Get Panda Express for dinner June 22nd. When you order online and type in our code, Panda Express will donate a portion of your order to our children's ministry at no extra cost to you. This is for online orders only. Order online for pickup or delivery at pandaexpress.com. We appreciate your participation in helping get our kids to camp. Do you still need help with yard work or housework? Our teens are still looking for work to help them to get to camp. Contact Pastor Tim for more information. On the chair in front of you, you'll find QR codes that you can scan at any time. We believe in taking the next steps to grow in our spiritual walk, and that includes plugging into church life. If you're a guest, we invite you to fill out our welcome card. This helps us connect with you. If you're ready to get plugged into a ministry and start serving, we invite you to fill out our serving card. Our ministry leaders will then contact you. You can give by scanning the QR code located on the seat in front of you. You can also drop off your offering in the boxes in the back of the sanctuary, or you can go to our church website. Thank you once again for joining us at Living Hope Church. I hope you have a blessed day. Hi. Hi, I'm Alejandro. I'm graduating from AAE and my future plans are to go to Stanford University and study aerospace engineering. Hello, my name is Sage. I'm graduating from Excelsior Charter School and my future plans are I will be going to VBC to continue on my AA and then for my undergraduate I will be going to either University of Redlands or Azusa Pacific. Hello, my name is uh, David Garcia. Uh, I graduated from Oak Hills High School. I'm attending VBC for one year to get my fire technology certificate, and from there I will apply for the fire academy. My name is Sarah. I'm graduated from Oak Hills High School. I plan on attending Sacramento State University and majoring in public relations and psychology. That time of year. Good morning again, everyone. My name is Pastor Carlos. I'm the pastor of Hispanic Ministries. Pastor Rich is at the annual convention in New Orleans. He is back next week. We are in, a, we'll be in Matthew chapter 5. We're going through uh, the Sermon on the Mount. We started this a couple of weeks ago. We'll be here through the rest of the year and part of next year. We're going through this verse by verse. The title of this series is The Culture of the Kingdom uh, because the Sermon on the Mount describes the characteristics, the culture of those who belong to God's kingdom. Uh, it, it occurs at the start of Jesus' ministry in the area of Galilee, and it's the first and longest recorded sermon of Jesus. Um, there's a summarized version in Luke verse 6, and it's divided in three sections, the Beatitudes, then he goes over the spirit of the law of Moses, and then the works of the believer. And we are in the first section, the Beatitudes. We are in the third Beatitude today. Um, and so we will be, I will read from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. If it's physically able, I, pay, I ask that you stand as we read God's word. God's word says the following. After seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor of spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your perfect word. We thank you, Lord, that you have left us your mind so that we can learn from you, Lord. I pray, Lord, as we go through the third beatitude, Lord, that we take it in, not just as information, but we take it outside of this church, 
and we live it in our daily lives. Bless those, Father, Father that are here, all the services that are to follow. I pray, Lord, that uh, as you bring them, may we be well preachers of your word. May we preach your word without any compromise. May we preach your word without watering down, Lord. And we may be good stewards of what you have entrusted to us for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So Jesus begins this sermon with these eight Beatitudes, and uh, we, ha we have seen uh, th two of them. We'll see the third one today. And all of these attitude, Beatitudes have three parts that I have in the uh, outline. Uh, it starts with a blessing. It says, I'll start with blessed. Uh, it, it then it tells us who are the blessed, and we've seen two of them so far. We've seen the poor in spirit, those who mourn, and today we'll see the third. And then it, it ends with a benefit. What is the benefit to those who are blessed? Uh, these are the three points we're reviewing for, uh, for all of the, 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 the Beatitudes. I won't go over the, in detail the, the first one because we did that the last two weeks, but it's in your bulletin. You can see the notes, but just on the blessing, just a reminder that what Jesus is saying here, the word blessing literally means happy. And, uh, but the word that happiness that Jesus is saying is not the happiness that the world seeks. It's not the happiness that the world pursues or knows. The happiness is the world that doesn't depend on what's going around, on the circumstances. Uh, the, the, the world seeks happiness by pursuing possessions, money, power, prestige. But none of that can provide us the happiness, the blessing that God offers. On the contrary, what the, word, what the world offers often causes anxiety and frustration because it's temporary happiness that does not satisfy and always leaves us wanting more. And in our eagerness to accumulate more, to find more, to, to build more, to have more, more, we often can't, do not enjoy the blessings that we already have that's in front of us. Um, it, it said that one afternoon a, a businessman was walking by a beach, and he's been going there every day, and he saw a young man, and he was there sitting on the beach under a palm tree with his family, and he had seen them there every day. So he walks over to him and he says, excuse me, sorry for interrupting, I see you're sitting here, you don't look like a tourist, so I wanted to know, do, do you need a job? I see you here sitting every day. And the young man says, no, not at all, I'm a fisherman, that's, that's my boat out there that you see. I go fishing in the morning, then I enjoy the rest of the day here in the beach with my family. And the businessman said, interesting, I, I imagine the sea gives you a lot of fish, right? He says, yes, indeed, just a couple of hours, I have enough fish that I can sell to the market and I can be able to provide for my family. And, and the businessman said, well, I don't understand. If it's so easy to fish, why don't you go fishing all day long? And the man says, why, why would I want to do that? Because if you could then have a lot more fish, you could sell more fish, and in a short time, you could buy another boat, hire more people to work for you. And the fisherman said, why would I want to do that? Because then you could earn more money. You could buy more boats. You could even buy your company. You have have people for You can become an industry leader, and then you can retire and have a fortune. And, he's, and the fisherman said, why would I want to do that? He said, because when you retire with money and you don't have to worry about money, you can retire in a beach and enjoy yourself under a palm tree with your family. <laughs> and the fisherman says, well, what am I doing? Isn't that what I'm already doing? You know, sometimes we often focus on accumulating more and more and more that we don't see the blessing that God has given us already. And there is nothing wrong with wanting more, wanting better things, a better house, the wanting financial security. What is wrong is when the pursuit of those things takes priority over a pursuit for God. God wants to fill our life with blessing, with happiness, but it's not what the world offers. It's a happiness, it's a blessing, that is continuous. It's a joy that's internal. It's not affected by what's going around. So today we will go into our third beatitude, um, and we've seen the first two. The first one is, uh, blessed are those who mourn. B blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And we talked about those are the ones who recognize their spiritual bankruptcy. They recognize that there's nothing they can do to earn God's favor. The second beatitude is those who mourn. 
those who mourn, those who have a deep sorrow for their sin. It's one thing to recognize you're a sinner. It's another thing to be in sorrow, mournful of your sin, that you humble yourself before God and ask for forgiveness. And today we go into the third beatitude, the blessed. Who is the blessed? The meek. Verse 5 says, blessed are the meek. In your notes, that would be the second bullet. Blessed are the meek, the second point. So what does it mean to be meek? The word meek in the world evokes different ideas in our mind. The first thing that comes is we may think of someone that's timid, someone that's quiet. Meek as a mouse is, 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 a, is a term. Someone that doesn't say much, someone that doesn't make waves, that just goes with the flows. To some, it even means someone who lacks courage, someone who's weak. But that's not what the Greek word here means. What it means is gentleness that comes out of humility. It, it's, it's sometimes used to describe a light wind. It's sometimes used to describe a, a soothing balm. But the word that Jesus uses here is one that is used to describe an animal that has been tamed. He is no longer wild no longer rebellious, no longer stubborn, no longer does what the animal wants to do. He is docile. He's submissive. He's obedient. He does what his owner instructs him to do. He has not lost his strength. I, 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 I've, I've, we've seen many where, where you have a, a, in a circus that the, that the lion goes crazy and, and maims people because they don't lose their power when they're tamed. He has not lost his power. He's still strong, but he has ceded his strength. He has ceded his power over to someone else. He has ceded control of his desires to his master. He suppresses that natural desire to do what he wants to do, but that animal does what his master tells him to do instead. That is the attitude of meekness that Jesus is talking about. That is the attitude of meekness that he's asking He's telling that those who inherit the earth should have. So what is the meek? The meek is one who does not demand that his own agenda be fulfilled, but submits to God's will. The meek is one who humbles himself and submits to God's purposes. And the best example of meekness and humility that submit to God's purposes is Jesus. I read this verse at the beginning of the service, Philippians 2, 5, 8. Paul says, make your own attitude that of Jesus Christ, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God that something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he came as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death to the cross. It was not Jesus' will in his human nature, to go to the, to the cross, to die that torturous death. The night of his arrest, he was praying and sweating drops of blood due to the anguish of going to the cross. And he even said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. The cup is the suffering. He says, Father, take this cup, take this suffering from me. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That is meekness. Being God, he humbled himself. He emptied himself. He took on the form of man. He did not cease to be God. He did not lose his power of God. He maintained his divinity. He was still all-powerful. He was still all-knowing. He didn't lose his divinity. He demonstrated that in his life by performing miracles, healing the sick, calming the storm, walking on water, forgiving sins. But he turned over that power to God's will. Jesus is the example of meekness that every child of God should follow. That's what the verse there says. Be, be as Jesus is, it says. The meek surrenders completely to God. Surrender all his being, all his thoughts, all his emotions, all his desires. And focuses on only doing what honors and pleases God. Being meek does not mean to be weak. Being meek does not mean to be a coward. Jesus was not weak. Jesus was not a coward. Twice he entered the temple and he drove all the money changers. He criticized and condemned the Jewish leaders and hypocrites to their face. He fiercely 
fearlessly preached about God's judgment. And he faced terrible hostilities. He was insulted, persecuted, and even went to death without fear. Jesus was not a coward. And there are many more examples in the Bible of meekness to do God's will. Abraham, God gave him the promised land. He said, this is yours, your descendants. It was he, he had the power, he had the authority to choose the best part of the land he wanted. He had the authority, he had the power. But to avoid disagreements with his brother, he told his brother, you choose first. He did not choose for his own benefit. He allowed God's plan to be fulfilled. Joseph, being the second in power in Egypt, he had the power to take revenge to his brothers who had sold him to slavery. But he refused to take revenge. He refused to treat his brothers as they had treated him. And he showed them love and compassion to those who wronged him. He humbled himself to do what was right. David, from a young age, he was anointed the next king of Israel. But Israel had a king already, King Saul. And so David had to wait. And this King Saul, out of jealousy, he was focused on chasing and getting rid of David. He wanted to kill David. That's what consumed his life. And on one occasion, he went into a cave, fell asleep, and David and his men were there. And David had the power to kill him. He had the authority to kill him. He had the opportunity to kill him. He had the opportunity to claim the throne that was rightfully his. He had the opportunity, he had the right, he had the power. But he waited because he wanted to wait on God's timing. The meek is one who empties himself, gives himself completely to fulfilling God's will. Uh, it, it, is not, it is to strip ourselves of our will, our desires, and turn them over to God. It is to give them all our being, all our attitudes, all our emotion, and allow Him to work through us. It is taming our desires, just like the wild animals are tamed to fulfill God's desire. It is allowing to be molded by God into Jesus' image. It is to make Jesus not only our Savior, but our Lord. There are many who declare Jesus as their Savior, but refuse to declare Him as Lord. I give Jesus two hours on Sunday, the rest is mine. I submit to God in church. Outside the church, I am the master of my own domain. I'll do whatever I want. It's a free country. That is not the attitude of a meek person who gives his life over to Jesus. It's somebody who has declared Jesus a Savior just as fire insurance so they don't burn in hell. And he may ask, to see, he, he may say, that person may say, I'm a Christian, but if you don't turn over your jive to Jesus, if you don't give him your life, you're not displaying that you belong to Jesus. You're not showing, you're not demonstrating that you are a child of God. Jesus says, who he will follow me, you have to die to yourself and follow me. Meekness is not weak. It's not being a coward. It also doesn't mean to be afraid. Some people interpret meekness as being afraid to express your conviction or, or being what we call wishy-washy. It's not hiding your faith so you don't offend others. It's not cowardness to say and do what God tells you to do. It's giving yourself. It's surrendering your power, your agenda, your plans, your will, your desires, your goals, your ambitions, your projects, your priorities. And trust that God will do more and beyond what you can imagine. Meekness is the characteristic that is produced from the internal, from a heart. It's a devotion of the heart that shows in the external. In Psalm 37, King David gives us a description of the characteristics of the character of the meek. Psalm 37, 3, 8 says, Trust the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take the light in the Lord, and He will give you your heart's desire. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust Him, and He will act. Make Him your righteous shine like the, make making your righteousness shine like the dawn, and your justice like the noonday. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for Him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way, by the man who carries on evil plans. Refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm. 
Now we know this is, if, uh, a lot of you, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, it has a, a, a footnote and it refers to this passage. Why? Because if you keep reading there, it says, these people who have these characteristics will inherit the earth, the same language that we see in the Beatitude. So we know we're talking about the meek. And there's, uh, uh, if you look at this passage in, in Psalm 37, we can see five characteristics of a meek. Five characteristics of the meek. First, the meek trust God. It says, trust the Lord and do what is good. Meekness is faith in the truest of senses. Because it is giving everything to Him and trusting Him for everything. It is saying, in my power I cannot do, do it, but I trust that God can because He is all-powerful. It is giving everything to God to the point where you have no, 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 no choice but to trust Him. It is what uh, Psalm 3, 6 says, uh, 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord in all your ways and He will direct your paths. This is the genuine faith that the meek demonstrates. The meek also delights in the Lord. It says, delight in the Lord and He will give you your heart's desire. Now, this verse has been misinterpreted many, many times, especially by the, those, um, uh, uh, the doctrine of prosperity where it says, you just ask God with faith and He will give you whatever you want. That's not what this verse is saying, what this passage is saying. Take the light in the Lord and He will give you what your heart's desire. What that means, it doesn't mean that He will give you, if you want a better job, you just delight in the Lord and He will give you a better job. It doesn't mean that you just ask Him for a better house and He will give you a better house. What it means is that if you give yourself completely to God, if you approach Him and you grow in Him, if you have a relationship with Him, if you know Him personally and pray to Him and understand Him and learn more from Him in His Word, the more you know Him, the more you get closer to Him, you understand what He desires. And the more you know Him, your desires become His desires. The more you know Him, whatever He wants becomes what you want, and His will always will be done. That's what it means. The meek also commits himself to God. He says, commit yourself to the Lord, trust in Him. The meek surrenders and commits his way to God. Doesn't look back. Doesn't look back. He gives it all over to God and looks forward to see where God will take him. He trusts that God will work in every situation because that's what he promises. That he, will wor he, he works in every situation for those who love him according to his purposes. The meek trust in God's ways and not in his ways. And then he's also say the meek wait on God. It says here, be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for Him. The, the Hebrew word there for be silent means to rest. It's much more than staying quiet. It's a peaceful rest and knowing that God is working. It is to give God everything without complaining, without arguing, without murmuring, without trying to convince Him that your plans are better. It is submitting to God's will and God's timing. That was Jesus. That was his attitude on the cross. He was falsely accused, insulted, condemned. The one who never sinned was treated as the worst of sinners. And he did not open his mouth. Isaiah 57, 57, I, 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 it's not in your notes, but I have it here. I'll give you this one for free. <laughs> Isaiah 57, 57 verse 7 says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep silent before his sharers. He did not open his mouth. Many times we say we submit, but we don't submit with the right attitude. We submit with words, but not with the heart. I'm going to turn this over to God because he said so. I don't think it's going to do any good. It might not be your desire to get fulfilled, but God's will. I'm going to forgive this brother. And I actually had somebody come to me, a, a Christian for 30 years, came to me and says, I'm going to forgive this brother because the God tells me, but I know he's going to offend me again. So what use will it be? How many times should I forgive him? Oh, man, that opened myself for preaching right there. <laughs> we often do that. We give to God by words, but not in our heart. And that's what it means to be silent and wait for God. It's the attitude, the character of the meek. It says also the meek does not anger 
He says, do not be agitated. Refrain from anger. Give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm. Why? Because rage is lack of self-control. Rage is doing what your flesh desires. Rage is taking something else controlling you other than God, your flesh. It's very interesting. Um, when I was writing this sermon, I'm usually, I wrote this sermon like three weeks ago, and um, I travel a lot for those of you who don't know. So what, what I do, I, in, in the weekend I read, I read the passage, I get my three points, and then during the week I spend one night for each point, and at the end of the week I'm finished. And I usually do that in the hotel when I'm traveling. Well, when I was writing this sermon, it was Wednesday night, and I was in this point over here, and I wrote the whole, like, like three hours before I went to bed. The next day, I was going to the airport, and I just had one final thing to do. So I get to the airport. I got there early to finish my sermon. I open my computer, and the file isn't there. I can't find any of my updates from yesterday. I was agitated. <laughs> I was frustrated. I was angry. My wife called me at that time, and I tell her what's happening. I go, I'll talk to you later, because she knows it's not the right time to talk to him. And then I started writing it again, and I get to this. I said, God, what were you trying to teach me? And I believe he was trying to teach me. No, not, I don't want you to just preach about not being angry. I want you to live not being angry. I found a file about, uh, this week I found what I had written. It's completely different than what God has put into my heart now. The meek is not unruly, does not get angry, does not get frustrated when things don't go their way, does not pour gasoline on the fire. Not that anger is all bad. Anger is not bad. Anger can lead to what's bad, can lead to sin. Ephesians 4.26, I believe, says, do, do, be angry, but do not sin. Jesus himself got angry, but he was angered for the right reasons when they offended his father. He was angry in the right way. He was angry at the right amount of time. Anger that goes out of these, bad, of these parameters is bad and can lead to sin. If you're angry about harm being done to your father in heaven, that's righteous anger. But if you're angry because somebody said something to you or hurt you or slighted you or you didn't get your ways, that is not a righteous anger. And Ephesians 4 also says, deal with it quickly before it becomes sin. The meek refrains from anger. Those are the attributes. Those are the characteristics of the meek. They give up everything of themselves for God's purposes. They trust in Him. They delight in Him. They commit to Him. They wait on Him. And they refrain from anger. To be meek, it's an absolute, utter lack of self-confidence and a total trust in God. It is trusting God in abundance. It's trusting God in need. And getting to the point where Paul says, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. The contents of that, of, that, of that verse there that we all know, it's Paul is saying, I'm fine with whatever comes because I know God is in control. I've, I've had, I know how it is to live in abundance. I know how it is when I don't have any. Regardless of it, I am trusting God. That brings us. To the, to the next point. We already see the blessing, the blessed. Now let's look at the benefit. It says, blessed are the meek. And what is the benefit? For they shall inherit the earth. Now we read this now and we, we, we understand what it says. But we have to put ourselves in the original listeners of the Sermon on the Mount. The, the, the impact that this would have had on them. We have to understand the context of the life of the Jews when Jesus gave this sermon. They lived in the land that God had promised Abraham and his descendants. The Jews, God's people, lived in the land that they had inherited, that was rightfully theirs, but that land did not belong to them. About a hundred years before Jesus made this statement on the Sermon on the Mount, Rome conquered and occupied Israel and most of the ancient world. Jews were subjects. They were servants. They were slaves in their own land. It was an abomination for them to be ruled by an external pagan empire. And Jesus makes this statement to people who had lost their inherited land and lived under the oppression in the same land that God had given to them. At the same time, Jews had been waiting for their Messiah to come, their Savior that would come to establish the kingdom of God. 
They looked forward to the coming of the Messiah that the prophets had promised. They anxiously awaited that Messiah to free them from the Roman oppression and return to them the land that they had inherited so that they could have the land that was rightfully theirs. They wanted that land to be returned to them. The more the Roman oppression, the more they intensified, the more control Roman exercised over them, the more they longed for their Messiah, their Savior, to come, to give them back their land. And that's why there was tremendous excitement when Jesus came and he said, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is at hand. They must have, they must have thought, the Messiah has come, finally, Rome will be defeated, finally, we will be free to inherit our land. The Messiah has come to give us back the land and to establish our state again. It is time for the pagan Romans to pay for oppressing God's people. Now they will see the power of God for the unbelievers. At last we will have what's rightfully ours, our inheritance. They expected this powerful Messiah, this vengeful Messiah to come to fight for their behalf and return their inherited land. Can you imagine their disappointment when this Messiah comes and says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those that are meek. That's not what they wanted to hear. That's not what they expected to hear. Why? Because that's not the attitude that's going to defeat the most powerful empire of the ancient world. And that is the classic example of studying God's work, God's word, buffet style. You know what it is, right? Buffet, you, you pick and choose what you like. And that's what you focus on. That's what had happened. That's what had happened to the Jewish at, at that time. They were focused on the prophecies of this conquering Messiah. And they ignore the prophecies of this humble, suffering Messiah. Those prophecies from, from Isaiah, you can read them from 40 to 46. That says that the Messiah would come to serve, to die. They ignore the prophecies that pointed to this humble servant this humble Messiah, because they were looking for a political savior, a political Messiah, a conquering military hero. So when Jesus says, blessed are the meek, he offends them. He offends them because he says the meek will inherit the kingdom of God. The poor in spirit, the ones who mourn. And Jesus tells them, basically, the ones who inherit the kingdom of God are not the powerful, are not the proud, are not the religious, which is what they were, but the meek, those who do not boast of their power, but cede their power. They were looking for a political Messiah, a conquering hero. Now, that does not mean that the prophecies of the conquering Messiah are wrong. Jesus came to the world as a humble servant, but he will return as a conquering king. He will come to destroy the enemies, and to establish God's kingdom. Revelations 19, 11 to 15. I'll, 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 I'll skip the middle part. It says, Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse, the rider called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war in righteousness. His eyes are like that of a fiery flame, and many crowns are on his head. The armies that are with heaven follow him on white horses, wearing pure linen, a sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will shepherd them with the iron scepter. He will also trample the winepress with, of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. That's what they were expecting Jesus to do with the Romans. Notice here that it says the armies of heaven will return with him. Those who belong to the kingdom of God will return with him. That's all of those who have been saved. Those are the ones who will come, and will, we will also have our white horses. Well, I sure hope there's horse riding trainings in heaven. I'm pretty sure there will be because I've never been on a horse in my life. Those are the ones who will be in heaven and will come down with Jesus to establish the kingdom. The poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who submit to God. Those are the ones who will inherit Jesus, or the, the, inherit the earth and reign with Jesus. When Jesus returns, it will be very different from the first time he came. The first time he came, he came as a servant. The second time, he will come as a conqueror. The first time he came, he came to redeem. He will now come to reign. The first time he came, 
to a cross, he will return to a crown. The first time he came to a tomb, the second time he will return to a throne. Jesus will return to establish, and this will be an earthly kingdom, a temporary kingdom, but he will also establish a heavenly kingdom in the future. His first kingdom will be here on earth, and it will be for a specific period, for a thousand years. It will be at the end of the tribulation, where Satan and his agents will be defeated, bound and cast, and thrown into abyss for a thousand years. Revelations 21, 3 says, Then I saw an angel coming down from earth, coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss and a great chain in hand. He sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. During that thousand years, that will be God's kingdom here on earth. He will reign here on earth. He will reign under the rule of the righteous king. Now, I know we're, we're, we're looking into the future, and there's many interpretations of this, but, but I do believe that the millennial kingdom will come after the tribulation, which will come after the rapture. And you don't, I'm, you're fine if you, I, I have, I read the Bible, and that's what I understand. If you believe differently, that is fine. You have the full right to be wrong. You don't have, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But the point here is, is that there will be an earthly millennial kingdom and who will inherit that millennial kingdom? All those who came down with him. The poor in spirit, those who mourn, and the meek. That's what Jesus is saying. We will reign with Jesus. We will reign with Jesus here on earth. But that's not the only kingdom that we will inherit. We will also inherit a heavenly and an eternal kingdom. 1 Peter 3.5 Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy... He has given a new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus, of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorruptible, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being protected by God's power through faith for salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. The word kept here literally means to reserve under lock and key. No one could take it away from you. No one can steal it. Why? Because it's protected by God's power. That's the heavenly kingdom that anyone who comes to him poor in spirit, who comes to him mourning for his sin, for the meek will inherit. And that, then the only way you can inherit this, it says there, it's through faith, not by works. Not by following rules, only by faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Everyone who belongs to the kingdom of God is an heir to this heavenly kingdom. This is our eternal reward. It's an imperishable, uncorrupted, unfading inher inheritance. And it's guaranteed. It's kept for us. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot be contaminated. And it can never lose its value. You cannot lose it because it's reserved for you the moment that you recognize your spiritual poverty, the moment that you mourn for the sin of your life, and the moment that you humbled yourself before Him in meekness, and you gave your life and control of your life to Him. Our inheritance is incor incorruptible, unfading, because our inheritance is God Himself. It is kept for us in heaven. It is the glory of God. Our inheritance is the glory of God for eternity. The radiance of His glory is the inheritance that awaits us. The inheritance is what we will have and be rejoiceful because we will have it forever. And that is all possible because Jesus came into the world as a humble and meek servant. Now we read at the beginning Philippians 2.5 where it says he, he came down from heaven, He gave up His power, He humbled Himself to the cross so that we can inherit the kingdom of God. And the day will come that story doesn't end there. Let me read to you Paul Harvey. What did Paul Harvey used to say? Here's the rest of the story. Here's the rest of the story of what happens. Philippians 2, 9, 11. For this reason, because he came down as a servant, humble, meek, submitting to God's will, doing what God wanted him to do so that we may be saved. For this reason, 
God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above all names, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. Amen. Now, folks, you can decide to come before God, meek, humble, submitting to His will now, or you can wait till it's later. But if you wait till it's later, it may be too late. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That is the third beatitude in the Sermon on the Mount. Now I want you to notice here the process that these are following. It says it started with the poor in spirit, those who recognize their spiritual bankruptcy, that we have nothing to offer. Recognize their helplessness, their inability to earn God's kingdom by their own power. And then it leads to those who are mourning, those who are crying, those who are repentant of their sin in their lives, those who recognize the damage that sin is causing, not just here on earth, but the eternal consequences. And they come before God, meekness, humble, submitting to God and turning their life over to God, giving Him control of their desires, of their will. And that are the ones who will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if you're here and you have never reached that point where you are sure that you have inherited God's kingdom, today is the day of salvation, God's word says. If that is you, I'll ask uh, uh, Rocky to come up and he'll play some songs there. But I'll pray, for, I'll pray. I'd like to pray for you. If that is you, if you, feel free to come up front. I'll be up front while Rocky's playing. Now, many of us, many of you, have uh, accepted Jesus many, many, many years ago, and maybe we're struggling with turning it over to God completely. If that is you, I also want to pray for you. So let's pray. Father, help us to be meek like Jesus. Help us to surrender to His fullness. Help us to surrender to His complete will. Help us to be characterized with the same meekness that Your Son Jesus was. Help us to submit all our instincts, all our impulses, all our wills to you and not ours. We pray for those who do not know Christ, who have not come to this place of acknowledging their spiritual bankruptcy, where they weep for the affliction of their sin and completely submit in meekness to your will. And Lord, to us who know you, Help us to renew that commitment to be humble and meek. Take away our pride. Take away our will. Take away our purposes, our plans, our desires. And let us be consumed by what only brings you honor and glory. May we be consumed by your will, your purposes, your plans, your desires. Use us powerfully through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you're here and you have never given up your will to God, I'll be in the back if you want to talk to me. Thank you all. We will confess the riches next week, and we will continue with the fourth beatitude. Thank you.